What time for a good book? Something that seems like where this uh, city and this structure of government was already established. And what I'm saying is like, this book is not about war or like some sort of siege, you know, like some sort of people trying to take over a village or corrupting it in any sort of way. This is already the American establishment, a young African-American boy, I guess an identity, talent on the mountain. And I'm right here in the hills by myself, kind of tucked away. Feeling blessed. It's New Year's. I'm gonna see my daughter in a bit. You know, I have had a good day so far. You know, if you have fears, know that the fears are only in your head, and it's, and it's you. You can still keep yourself all together. I was watching a movie the other day, the one with Halle Berry. Um, she's a she UFC fighter. It's like the Rocky version of a woman. It's a little exaggerative with all like the pretty horrible violence in there. Like the street fights, is like a pretty pretty dramatic but in that book it says it told the little boy when you're afraid put your hands in the air and just breathe and that's like a good thing like what i'm saying if you have fears of anything you can just st be still trust in god trust in the world you know trust in the good positive stuff you've ever read the bible in the bible it says to be still and uh, be still and know that i am god just control your mind and choose the right words and the right actions to, to create, you know? And um, so I'm gonna read this book, the first chapter of James Baldwin. Shout out James Baldwin, rest in peace. One of the, I would say, I would still call him modern. He's not like a 2000 author. He's like mid 1900s or maybe like 1980s or 70s. Could be totally wrong. You know, that gives you guys an idea to look that up. I'm not going to give it away. James Baldwin would appreciate that if I didn't, but I asked the question for you to think, you know. So, um, table of contents says part one, the seventh day. And the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that heareth say, come, let him that is a thirst come. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Part one, the seventh day. I looked down the line and I wondered. That's, you know, authors like to have a little message. That's the first two sentences right there. The first two lines. Everyone had always said that John would be a preacher when he grew up, but just like his father, or just like his father, it had been said so often that John, without ever thinking about it, had come to believe it himself. Not until the morning of his 14th birthday did he really begin to think about it. And by then it was already too late. His earliest memories, which were in a way his only memories, were of the hurry and brightness of Sunday mornings. They all rose together on that day. His father, who did not have to go to work, led them in prayer before breakfast. His mother, who dressed up on that day and looked almost young, with her hair straightened and on her head the close-fitting white cap that was the uniform of holy women. His younger brother, Roy, who was silent that day because his father was home. Sarah, who wore a red ribbon in her hair that day and was fondled by her father. And the baby Ruth, who was dressed in pink and white and rode in her mother's arm, in her mother's arms to church. The church was not very far away, four blocks up Lenox Ave, on a corner not far from the hospital. It was to this hospital that his mother had gone when Roy and Sarah and Ruth were born. Did John not remember very clearly the first time she had gone to have Roy? Folks said that he had cried and carried on the whole time his mother was away. He remembered only enough to be afraid every time her belly began to swell, knowing that each time the swelling began, it would not end until she was taken from him to come back with a stranger. Each time this happened, she became a little more of a stranger herself. She would soon be going away again, Roy said. He knew much more about such things than John. John had observed his mother closely, seeing no swelling yet, but his father had prayed one morning for the little voyager soon to be among them, and so John knew that Roy spoke the truth. Every Sunday morning then, since John could remember, they had taken to the streets the Grimes family on their way to church. Sinners along the avenue watched them, men still wearing their Saturday night clothes, wrinkled and dusty now, muddy-eyed and muddy-faced, and women with harsh voices and tight, bright dresses, cigarettes between their fingers or held tightly in the corner of their mouth. Corners of their mouths, they talked and laughed and fought together. 
and the women fought like the men. John and Roy passing these men and women looked at one another briefly. John embarrassed and Roy amused. Roy would be like them when he grew up if the Lord did not change his heart. These men and women, they passed on Sunday mornings and spent the night in bars or in cat houses or on the streets or on rooftops or under the stairs. They had been drinking. They had gone from cursing to laughter to anger to lust. Once he and Roy had watched the man and woman in the basement of a condemned house. They did it standing up. The woman had wanted 50 cents and the man had flashed a razor. John had never watched it again. He had been afraid, but Roy had watched it many times. And he told John he had done it with some girls down the block. And his mother and father who went to church on Sundays, they did it too. And sometimes John heard them in the bedroom and behind him, or in the bedroom behind him over the sound of rat's feet and rat's screams and the music and cursing from the harlot's house downstairs. The church was called the Temple of Fire Baptized. The church was called the Temple of the Fire Baptized. It was not the biggest church in Harlem, nor yet the smallest, but John had been brought up to believe it was the holiest and best. His father was head deacon in this church. There were only two, the other, a round black man named Deacon Braith Waite, and he took up the collection and sometimes he preached. The pastor, Father James, was a genial, well-fed man with a face like a darker moon. It was he who preached on the Pentecost Sundays and led revivals in the summertime and anointed and healed the sick. On Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, the church was always full. On special Sundays, it was full all day. The Grimes family arrived in a body, always a little late, usually in the middle of Sunday school, which began at nine o'clock. This lateness was always her mother's fault. At least in the eyes of their father, she could not seem to get herself and the children ready on time. Ever and sometimes she actually, she actually remained behind not to appear until the morning service. When they all arrived together, they separated upon entering the doors, father and mother going to sit in the doll class, which was taught by Sister McCandles, Sarah going to the infants class, John and Roy sitting in the intermediate, which was taught by brother Elisha. When he was young, John had paid no attention in Sunday school and always forgot the golden text which earned him the wrath of his father. Around the time of his 14th birthday, with all the pressures of church and home uniting to drive him to that altar, he strove to appear more serious and therefore less conspicuous. But he was distracted by his new teacher, Elisha, who was a pastor's nephew and who had but lately arrived from Georgia. He was not much older than John, only 17, and he was already saved and was a preacher. John stared at Elisha all during the lesson, admiring the timber of Elisha's voice much deeper and manlier than his own, admiring the leanness and grace and strength and darkness of Elisha in his Sunday suit, wondering if he would ever be holy as Elisha was holy. But he did not follow the lesson, and when sometimes Elisha paused to ask John a question, John was ashamed and confused, feeling the palms of his hands become wet and his heart pound like a hammer. Elisha would smile and reprimand him gently, and the lesson would go on. Roy never knew his Sunday school lesson either, but it was different with Roy. No one really expected of Roy what was expected of John. Everyone was always praying that the Lord would change Roy's heart, but it was John who was expected to be good, to be a good example. When Sunday school service ended, there was a short pause before morning service again and this pause if it was good weather the old folks might step outside a moment to talk among themselves the sisters would always be dressed in white from crown to toe the small children on this day in this place and oppressed by their elders try hard to play without seeming to be disrespectful disrespectful god's house but sometimes nervous or perverse they shouted or threw hymn books or began to cry putting their parents men or women of god under the necessity of proving by harsh means or tender who in a sanctified household ruled the other children like john and roy might wander down the avenue but not too far the father never let john and roy out of his sight for roy had often disappeared between sunday school and morning service and had not come back all day morning sunday uh, the sunday morning service began when brother elisha sat down at the piano and raised a song this moment and this music had been with John, so it seemed since he had first drawn breath, it seemed that there had never been a time when he had not known this moment of waiting while the packed church paused, the sisters in the white, heads raised, the brothers in blue, heads back, the white caps of the women seeming to glow in the charged air like crowns, the kinky, gleaming heads of the men seeming to be lifted up, and the rustling and the whispering ceased, and the children were quiet. Perhaps someone coughed, or the sound of a car horn, or a curse from the streets came in, and Alicia hit the keys, beginning at once to sing, and everybody joined him, clapping their hands and rising and beating the tambourines. The song might be down at the cross where my savior died or Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Or Lord, hold my hand while I run this race. They sang with all the strength that was in them and clapped their hands for joy. There had never been a time when John had not sat watching the saints rejoice with terror in his heart and wonder. Their singing caused him to believe in the presence of the Lord. Indeed, it was no longer a question of belief because they made the presence real. He did not feel it himself, the joy they felt, yet he could not doubt that it was for them the very bread of life. Could not doubt it, that is, until it was too late. Too late to doubt. Something happened to their faces and their voices, the rhythm of their bodies and the air they breathed. It was as though wherever they might be became the upper room. 
and the Holy Ghost were riding on the air. His father's face, always awful, became more awful now. Awful now. His father's daily anger was transformed into pro prophetic wrath. His mother, her eyes raised to heaven, raised arsed before her, moving, made real for John that patience, that endurance, that long suffering which he had read of in the Bible and found so hard to imagine. On Sunday mornings, the women all seemed patient. All the men seemed mighty. While John watched, the power struck someone, a man or woman. They cried out, a long, wordless crying, and arms outstretched like wings. They began to shout. Someone moved a chair a little to give them room. The rhythm paused. The singing stopped. Only the pounding feet and the clapping hands were heard. Then another cry, another dancer. Then the tambourines began again, and the voices rose again, and the music swept on again like fire, oh, flood, or judgment. Then the church seemed to swell with the power it held, and like a planet rocking in space, the temple rocked with the power of God. John watched, watched the faces and the weightless bodies, and listened to the timeless cries. One day, so everyone said, this power would possess him. He would sing and cry as they did now and danced before his king. He watched young Alame Washington, the 17-year-old granddaughter of praying mother Washington, as she began to dance, and then Elisha danced. At one moment, head thrown back, eyes closed, sweat standing on his brow. He sat at the piano, singing and playing, and then like a great black cat in trouble in the jungle, he, sti he stiffened and trembled and cried out, Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, he struck on the piano one last wild note and threw up his hands, palms upward, stretched wide apart. The tambourines raced to fill the vacuum left by his silent piano, and his cry drew answering cries. Then he was on his feet, turning blind, his face congested, contorted with this rage, and the muscles leaping and swelling in his, in his long, dark neck. It seemed that he could not breathe, that his body could not contain this passion, that he would be before their eyes dispersed into the waiting air. His hands, rigid to the very fingertips, moved outward and back against his hips. His sightless eyes looked upward and began to dance. Then his hands closed into fists and his head snapped downward, his sweat loosening the grease and slicked down his hair. And the rhythm of all the others quickened to match Alicia's rhythm. His thighs moved terribly against the cloth of his suit. His heels beat on the floor and his fists moved beside his body as though he were beating his own drum. And so for a while, in the center of the dancer's head down, fists beating on, on, unbearably, unbearably until this seemed the walls of the church would fall for very sound and then in a moment with the cry head up arms in the air sweat pouring from his forehead and all his body dancing as though it would never stop sometimes he did not stop until he fell until he dropped like some animal failed by a hammer moaning on his face and then a great moaning filled the church There was sin among them. One Sunday when regular service was over, Father James had uncovered sin in the congregation of the righteous. He had uncovered Elisha and Alame. They had been walking disorderly. They were in danger of straying from the truth. And as Father James spoke of the sin that he knew had not committed yet, of the unripe fig plucked too early from the tree to set the children's teeth on edge, John found himself grow dizzy in his seat and could not look at Elisha where he stood beside Alame before the altar. Elisha hung his head as Father James spoke and the congregation murmured. And Alame, Alame was not so beautiful now as she was when she was singing and testifying, but looked like a soul and ordinary girl. Her full lips were loose and her eyes were black with shame or rage or both. Her grandmother who had raised her sat watching quietly with folded hands. She was one of the pillars of the church, a powerful evangelist and very widely known. She said nothing in Alame's defense for she must have felt as a congregation felt that Father James was only ex exercising his clear and painful duty. He was responsible, after all, for Alicia as praying mother Washington was responsible for Alan May. It was not an easy thing, said Father James, to be the pastor of a flock. It might look easy to just sit up there in the pulpit night after night, year in, year out, but let them remember the awful responsibility placed on his shoulders by Almighty God. Let them remember that God would ask an accounting of him one day for every soul in his flock. Let them remember this when they thought he was hard. Let them remember the word was hard. That the way of holiness was a hard way there was no room in god's army for the coward heart no crown awaiting him who put mother or father sister or brother or sweetheart or friend above god's will let the church cry amen to this and they cried amen amen the lord had led led him said father james looking down on the boy and girl before him to give them a public warning before it was too late for he knew them to be sincere young people dedicated to the service of the lord it was only that since they were young they did not know the pitfalls satan laid for the unwary he knew that sin was not in their minds not yet sin was in the flesh and should they continue with their walking out alone together their secrets and laughter and touching of hands they would surely sin a sin beyond all forgiveness and john wondered what alicia was thinking alicia who was tall and handsome who played basketball and who had been saved at the age of 11 and the improbable fields down south had he sinned had he been tempted and the girl beside him whose white robes now seemed the merest thinnest covering for the nakedness of breasts and insistent thighs what was her face like when she was alone with alicia with no singing when they were no when they were not surrounded by the saints he was afraid to think of it yet he could think of nothing else and the fever of which they accused began also to rage in him after this sunday elisha and alame no longer met each other 
each day after school. No longer spent Saturday afternoons wandering through Central Park or lying on the beach. All that was over for them. If they came together again, it would be in wedlock. They would have children and raise them in the church. This is what meant by a holy life. This is what the way of the cross demanded. It was somehow on that Sunday, a Sunday shortly before his birthday, that John first realized that this was a life awaiting him, realized it consciously as something no longer far off, but imminent, coming closer day by day. John's birthday fell on a Saturday in March in 1935. He awoke on his birthday morning with the feeling that there was a menace in the air around him, that something irrevocable had occurred to him. He stared at a yellow stain on the ceiling just above his head. Roy was still smothered in the bedclothes, and his breath came and went with a small whistling sound. There was no other sounds anywhere. No one in the house was up. The neighbor's radios were all silent, and his mother hadn't yet risen to fix his father breakfast. John wondered at his panic and wondered about the time, and then while the yellow stain on the ceiling slowly transferred itself into a woman's nakedness, he remembered that it was his 14th birthday and that he had sinned. His first thought, nevertheless, was will anyone remember, for it had happened once or twice that his birthday had passed entirely unnoticed, and no one had said happy birthday, Johnny, or given him anything, not even his mother. Roy stirred again, and John pushed him away, listening to the silence. On other mornings, he awoke, hearing his mother singing in the kitchen, hearing his father in the bedroom behind him grunting and muttering prayers to himself as he put him put on his clothes hearing perhaps the chatter of sarah and the squalling of ruth and the radios the clatter of pots and pans and the voices of all the folk nearby this morning not even the cry of a bedspring disturbed the silence and john seemed therefore to be listening to his own unspeaking doom he could believe almost that he had awakened late on that great getting up morning that all the saved have been had, all the saved had been transformed in the twinkling of an eye and had risen to meet Jesus in the clouds, and that he was left with his sinful body to be bound in hell a thousand years. He had sinned in spite of the saints, his mother and his father, the warnings he had heard from his earliest beginnings. He had sinned with his hands, a sin that was hard to forgive. In the school lavatory alone, thinking of the boys, older, bigger, braver, who made bets with others, other with each other as to who whose urine could reach or could arch higher he had watched in himself a transformation of which he would never dare to speak and the darkness of john's sin was like the darkness of the church on saturday evenings like the silence of the church while he was there alone sweeping and running water running water into the great bucket and overturning chairs long before the saints arrived it was like his thoughts as he moved about the tabernacle in which his life had been spent the tabernacle that he hated yet loved and feared it was like roy's curses like the echoes these curses raised in john he remembered roy on some rare saturday when he had come to help john clean the church cursing in the house of god and making obscene gestures before the eyes of jesus it was like all this and it was like the walls that witnessed and the placards on the walls which testified that the wages of sin was death the darkness of his sin was in his hard heartedness with which he resisted god's power and the scorn that was often his while he listened to the crying breaking voices and watched the black skin glisten while they lifted up their arms and fell on their faces before the lord for he had made his decision he would not be like his father or his father's fathers he would have another life for john excelled in school though not like elisha in mathematics or basketball and it was said that he had a great future he might become a great leader of his people john was not much interested in his people and still less in leading them anywhere but the phrase so often repeated rose in his mind like a great brass gate opening outward for him on a world where it did, did not live in the darkness of his father's house, did not pray to Jesus in the darkness of his father's church where he would eat good food and wear fine clothes and go to the movies as often as he wished. In this world, John, who was his father, said ugly, who was always the smallest boy in his class and who had no friends, became immediately beautiful, tall, and popular. People fell all over themselves to meet John Grimes. He was a poet or a college president or a movie star. He drank expensive, expensive whiskey and he smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes in the green package. It was not only colored people who praised John. Since they could not, John felt in any case really know, but why people also said it in fact had said it first and said it still was when John was five years old and in the first grade that he was first noticed. And since he was noticed by an eye altogether alien and impersonal, he began to perceive in wild uneasiness his individual existence. They were learning the alphabet that day and six children at a time were sent to the blackboard to write the letters they had memorized. Six had finished and were waiting for the teacher's judgment when the back door opened and the school principal, whom everyone was terrified, entered the room. No one spoke or moved. In the silence, the principal's voice said, Which child is that? She was pointing at the blackboard at John's letters. The possibility of being distinguished by her notice did not enter John's mind, and so he simply stared at her. Then he realized by the immobility of the other children and by the way they avoided looking at him that it was he who was selected for punishment. Speak up, John, said the teacher gently. On the edge of tears, he mumbled his name and waited. The principal, a woman with white hair and iron face, looked down at him. You're a very bright boy, John Grimes, she said. Keep up the good work. Then she walked out of the room. Sorry, guys. Like, I'm sitting here and in my head, I'm like, because I'm sitting just like on this water pipe, this big ass, like, service pipe. I feel like tiny 
I don't know. I feel like once you get it in your head that something's walk like crawling on you, you don't want to fucking. This is a very interesting book, but there's a bunch of ants right here. So yeah, there's a bunch of ants on my stuff. There's probably ants on me, you know. I'm gonna sit somewhere. Maybe I'll just stand up and read. I do that sometimes. I'll get my water out. So it's a good book so far. Again, like they would always just go to church back then in those societies. I guess like, I don't know. Just try to stay together and not separate. I wonder if like the leaders of the African American communities back then, once they were given freedom, like they could see like what the society was trying to implement and how they were really trying to like put society forward and uh, yeah. and they were just trying their hardest to keep the family intact or were they so war beaten from like slavery and shit you know once they got a taste of that alcohol their pain you know being raped and I don't know bad shit happening to them imagine imagine these no, they never talk about the homeless. I mean, I mean the the slave, the slave. Like, how many slaves were there? <coughs> Excuse me. These are big plantations. You could think of maybe like a hundred slaves on there. So they be they have neighborhoods. Like there was like blocks of like like how many African American people were there? Like, was it not that many? Do they not need a lot of slaves? Like, do they kill kill a lot of them off? You know, it's like a crazy conversation. Like, and like, you know, I'm sure within were, were, were any slaves killing each other from then? Like, was there any like any of them sleeping with each other's wives or like, or or, or were they united through trying to survive as a people? You know, <laughs> but I can imagine <laughs> these being like little camps. Or they have their own, like, lodging, or you know what I'm saying? After work, they go back to their fucking bunks and shit, you know? I'm sure they would, didn't have the best uh, luxuries, you know? If you got a job being able to be inside the house, I'm sure you would be able to get extra shit. Like, if you're in jail and you become, like, a trustee. You don't want to think about that shit, you know? Anyway, I can't end this because I want a little bit of coffee. Maybe it's a... Drink a little bit of water. This is the first chapter. John, his brother is Rudy. Is it Rudy or Roy? I'm getting it totally wrong. And then talking about his little sister. I guess mom had another baby. And the dad, and they go to church. And he's just talking about how, like, it's like the innocent story. I get some water. It's a neat story. Oh, shit. And just covering it up. It's a new year. Less than less than a day away from a new year. I have like 15 books I have under my belt, but I mean, I, I only sorry, I only have like probably 13 that I finished. I mean, I'm starting this one, so I have to finish this one in 100 Years of Solitude, so. What did I leave off right here? I have this uh, string connected to a portable, portable charger right here, so. Shit. Okay, so. You're a very bright boy, John Grimes. So I guess John, I guess he like solved the problem or wrote something. Keep up the good work. Then she she uh, walked out of the room. That moment gave him from that time on, if not a weapon, at least a shield. He apprehended totally without belief or understanding that he had in himself a power that other people lacked, that he could use this to save himself, to raise himself, and that perhaps with this power he might one day win that love which he so longed for. This was not in John a faith subject to death or alteration, nor yet a hope subject to destruction. It was his identity in part, therefore, of that wickedness for which his father beat him and to which he clung in order to withstand his father. His father's arm rising and falling might make him cry. 
and that voice might cause him to tremble, yet his father could never be entirely the victor, for John cherished something that his father could not reach. It was his hatred and his intelligence that he cherished, the one feeding the other. He lived for the day when his father would be dying, and he, John, would curse him on his deathbed, and this was why, though he had been born in the faith and had been surrounded all his life by the saints and by their prayers and their rejoicing, and though the tabernacle in which they worshipped was more completely real to him than the several precarious homes in which he and his family had lived, John's heart was hard against the Lord. His father was God's minister, the ambassador of the King of Heaven, and John could not bow before the throne of grace without first kneeling to his father. On his refusal to do this, had his life depended. On his refusal to do this, had his life depended, and John's secret heart had flourished in its wickedness until the day his sin first overtook him. Okay, hold on. I think it's a different scene because it had like this little like line at the end of that paragraph. I felt like something was crawling like in my shorts. <sighs> Boogers. But um Oh yeah, so in the midst of all his wanderings he fell asleep again, and when he woke up this time and got out of his bed, his father had gone to the factory where he would work for half a day. Roy was sitting in the kitchen and quarreling with her mother. The baby, Ruth, sat in her high chair banging on the tray with an oatmeal-covered spoon. This meant that she was in a good mood. She would not spend the day howling for reasons known only to herself, allowing no one but her mother to touch her. Sarah was quiet, not chattering today, or at any rate not yet, and stood near the stove, arms folded, staring at Roy with the flat black eyes, her father's eyes that made her look so old. The mother, oh, the mother, the mother, her head tied up in an old rag, sipped black coffee and watched Roy. The pale end of winter sunlight filled the room and yellowed all their faces. And John, drugged and morbid and wondering how it was that he had slept again and had been allowed to sleep so long, saw them for a moment like figures on a screen, an effect that the yellow light intensified. The room was narrow and dirty. Nothing could alter his dimensions, nor labor could ever make it clean. Dirt was in the walls and the floorboards and triumph beneath the sink where roaches spawned but was in the fine ridges of the pots and pans scored daily burnt black on the bottom hanging above the stove was in the wall against which they hung and revealed itself where the paint had cracked and leaned outward in stiff squares and fragments the paper thin underside webbed with black dirt was in every corner angle crevice of the monstrous stove and lived behind it in delirious com communion with the corrupted wall dirt was in the baseboard that john scrubbed every saturday and roughened the cupboard shelves that held the cracked and gleaming dishes under this dark weight the walls leaned under it the ceiling with the great crack like lightning in the center sagged the windows gleamed like beaten gold or silver but now john saw in the yellow light how fine dust failed their doubtful glory dirt crawled in the gray mop hung out of the windows to dry john thought with the shame and horror he had an angry hardness of heart he who was filthy let him be filthy still then he looked at his mother seeing as though she were someone else the dark hard lines running downward from her eyes and the deep perpetual scowl on her forehead and the downturned tightened mouth and the strong thin brown and and bony hands and the phrase turned against him like a two-edged sword for was it not he in his false pride and evil imagination who was filthy through a storm of tears that did not reach his eyes he stared at the yellow room and the room shifted the light of the sun darkened and his mother's face changed her face became the face that he gave her in his dreams the face that had been hers in a photograph he had seen once long ago a photograph taken before he was born this face was young and proud his face was young and proud, uplifted with the smile that made the wide mouth beautiful and glowed in the enormous eyes. It was the face of a girl who knew that no evil could undo her and who could laugh. Surely, as his mother did not laugh now, between the, between the two faces there stretched a darkness and mystery that John feared and that sometimes caused him to hate her. Now she saw him and she asked, breaking off her conversation with Roy, You hungry, little sleepyhead? Well, about time he was getting up, said Sarah. He moved to the table and sat down, feeling the most bewildering panic of his life, a need to touch things, the table and chairs and the walls of the room, to make certain that the room existed and that he was in the room. He did not look at his mother, who stood up and went to the stove to heat his breakfast, but he asked in order to say something to her and, and to hear his own voice, what we got for breakfast. He realized with some shame that he was hoping she had prepared a special breakfast for him on his birthday. What do you think we got for breakfast? Roy asked scornfully. You got a special craving for something? John looked at him. Roy was not in a good mood. I ain't said nothing to you, he said. Oh, I beg your pardon, said Roy. In the, in, in the shrill little girl tone, he knew John hated. What's the matter with you today, John asked, angry and trying at the same time to lend his voice. 
to lend his voice as husky a pitch as possible. Don't you let Roy bother you, said their mother. He crossed as two sticks this morning. Yeah, said John, I reckon he and Roy watched each other, then his plate was put before him. How many grits and a scrap a scrap of bacon? He wanted to cry like a child, but Mama, it's my birthday. He kept his eyes on his plate and began to eat. You can talk about your daddy all you want to, said his mother, picking up her battle with Roy. But one thing you can't say, you can't say he ain't always done his best to be a father to you and to see it that you ain't never gone hungry. I've been hungry plenty of times, Roy said, proud to be able to score this point against his mother. Wasn't his fault then, wasn't because he wasn't trying to feed you. That man shoveled snow in zero weather when he ought to have been in bed just to put food in your belly. Wasn't just my belly, said Roy indignantly. He got a belly too. I know it's a shame the way that man eats. I sure ain't asked him to shovel no snow for me. But he dropped his eyes, suspecting a flaw in his argument. I just don't want him beating on me all the time, he said at last. I ain't no dog. She sighed and turned slightly away, looking out of the window. Your daddy beats you, she said, because he loves you. Roy laughed. That ain't the kind of love I understand, old lady. What do you reckon he'd do if he didn't love me? He let you go right on. She flashed right on down to hell, where it looks like you just as determined to go anyhow. Right on, mister, man, until somebody puts a knife in you or takes you off to jail. Mama, John asked suddenly, is daddy a good man? He had not known that he was going to ask the question, and he watched in astonishment as her mouth tightened and her eyes grew dark. That ain't no kind of question, she said mildly. You don't know no better, man. Do you? Looks to me like he's a mighty good man, said Sarah. He sure is praying all the time. Your children is young, their mother said, ignoring Sarah and sitting down again at the table. You don't know how lucky you is to have a father that worries about you and tries to see to it that you come up right. Yes, yeah, said Roy. We don't know how lucky we is to have a father but don't want you to go to the movies and don't want you to play in the streets and don't want you to have no friends and you don't want this and you don't want that and you don't want you to do nothing. We so lucky to have a father who just wants us to go to church and read the Bible and bowler like a fool in front of the altar and stay home all nice and quiet like a little mouse. Well, see, this uh, conversation turned out to be pretty good. Boy, we're sure lucky, all right. Don't know what I done to be so lucky. She she laughed. You're going to find out one day, she said. You mark my words. Yes, yeah, said Roy. But it'll be too late then, she said. It'll be too late when you come to be sorry. Her voice had changed for a moment. Her eyes met John's eyes, and John was frightened. He felt that her words, after the strange fashion God sometimes chose to speak to men, were dictated by heaven and were meant for him. He was 14. Was it too late? And this uneasiness was reinforced. This uneasiness was reinforced by the impression, which at the moment he realized had been his all along, that his mother was not saying everything she meant. What he wondered, did she say to Aunt Florence when they talked together or to his father? What were her thoughts? Her face would never tell, and yet looking at looking down at him in a moment that was like a secret passing sign, her face did tell him her thoughts were bitter. I don't care, Roy said, rising. When I have children, I ain't going to treat them like this. John watched his mother. She watched Roy. I'm sure this ain't no way to be. Ain't got no right to have a house full of children if you don't know how to treat them. You might have grown up in this you might have grown up this morning, his mother said, You be careful. And tell me something, Roy says, suddenly leaning over his mother. Tell me how come he did he don't never let me talk to him like I talk to you. He's my father, ain't he? But he don't ever listen to me. No. I all the time got to listen to him. Your father, she said, watching him knows best. You listen to your father, I guarantee you you won't have been in you won't end up in no jail. Roy sucked his teeth in fury. I ain't looking to go to no jail. You think that's all that is in the world? It's just jails and churches. You gotta know better than that, Ma. I know she said, there ain't no safety except to walk humble before the Lord. You're going to find it out too one day. You go on, hardhead. You're going to come to grief. And suddenly Roy grinned. But you, you be there, won't you, Ma, when I'm in trouble? You don't know, she said, trying not to smile. How long the Lord's going to let me stay with you? Roy Turner did not, or did a dance step. That's all right, he said. I know the Lord ain't as hard as daddy, is he? Boy, he demanded of John and struck him lightly on the forehead boy let me eat my breakfast john muttered through his plate had long been empty and he was pleased that roy had turned to him that sure is a crazy boy ventured sarah soberly just listen cried roy to the to the little saint daddy ain't never going to have no trouble with her that one she was born holy i bet the first word she ever said was thank you jesus ain't that so ma you stop this foolishness she said laughing and go on about your work can't nobody play the fool with you all morning oh is you got work for me to do this morning well i declare said roy what you got for me to do i got the woodwork in the dining room for you to do and you're going to do it too before you set foot out of this house now why you want to talk like that ma <laughs> As I said, I. I don't want the video to stop. As I said, I wouldn't do it. You know, I'm a I'm a right good worker when I got a mind. After I do it, can I go? You go ahead and do it, and we'll see. You better do it right. I always do it right, said Roy. You won't know old world work when I get through. John said his mother. 
John, said his mother, you sweep the front room for me like a good boy and dust the furniture. I'm going to clean up in here. Yes, son, he said and rose. She had forgotten about his birthday. He swore he would not mention it. He would not think about it anymore. To sweep the front room meant principally... To sweep the front room meant principally to sweep the heavy red and green and purple oriental style carpet that had once been the room's glory but was now so faded that it was all one swimming color and so frayed in the places that it tangled with the broom. John hated sweeping this carpet for dust rose clogging his nose and sticking to his sweaty skin and he felt that shouldn't he sweep it forever and he felt that should he sweep it forever the clouds of dust would diminish the rug would not be clean it came in his imagination his impossible lifelong task his hard trial like that of a man he had read about somewhere whose curse it was to push a boulder up a steep hill only to have the giant who guarded the hill roll the boulder down again and so on forever throughout eternity he was still out there the hapless man somewhere at the other end of the earth pushing his boulder up the hill he had john's entire sympathy for the longest and hardest part of his saturday mornings was his voyage with the broom across his endless rug and coming to the french doors that ended the living room and stopped the rug he felt like an indescribably weary traveler who sees his home at last yes for each dustpan he was so laboriously filled at the door sill his laborious laboriously laboriously filled at the door sill demons added to the rug 20 more he saw in the expanse behind him the dust that he had raised settling again into the carpet and he gritted his teeth already on edge because of the dust that filled his mouth and nearly wept to think that so much labor brought so little reward <laughs> he just he, bro, you're just sweeping a rug bro nor was this the end of John's labor, for having put away the broom and the dustpan he took from the small bucket under the sink, the dust rag and the furniture oil and a damp cloth, and returned to the living room to excavate, as it were, from the dust that threatened to bury them, his family's goods and gear. Thinking bitterly of his birthday, he attacked the mirror with the cloth, watching his face appear as out of a cloud. With the shock, he saw that his face had not changed, that the hand of Satan was as yet invisible. His father had always said that his face was the face of Satan, and was there not something in the lift of the eyebrow and the way his rough hair formed a V on his, his brow that bore witness to his father's words? In the eye, there was a, a light that was not the light of heaven, and the mouth trembled lustful and lewd to drink deep of the wines of hell. He stared at his face as though it were as indeed it soon appeared to be the face of a stranger, a stranger who held secrets that John could never know. And having thought of it as the face of a stranger, he tried to look at it as a stranger might and try to discover what other people saw, but he saw only details, two great eyes and a broad low forehead and the triangle of his nose and his enormous mouth and the barely perceptible cleft in his chin, which was, his father said, the mark of the devil's fin little finger. These details did not help him for the principle of their unity was undiscoverable and he could not tell what he most passionately desired to know, whether his face was ugly or not. And he dropped his eyes to the mantelpiece. Lifting by one of the objects that adorned it. I don't know, so it said. And he dropped his eyes to the mantelpiece. Lifting one by the objects that adorned it. The mantelpiece held in brave confusion photographs, greeting cards, flowered mottos, two silver candlesticks that had no candles, and a green a green metal serpent poised to strike. Today in his Today, in his apathy, John stared at them, not seeing. He began to dust them with the exaggerated care of the profoundly preoccupied. One of the models was pink and blue and proclaimed in raised letters, which made the work of dusting harder. Come in the evening or come in the morning. Come when you're looked for or come without warning. A thousand welcomes you find here before you. And the oftener you come here, the more will adore you. And the other in letters of fire against the backgrounds of gold stated, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever so loved... That, that whosoever should believe in God and Jesus should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. These somewhat unrelated sentiments decorated either side of the mantelpiece, obscured a little by the silver candlesticks between these two extremes, the greeting cards received year after year on Christmas or Easter or birthdays trumpeted these glad tidings, while the green metal serpent, perpetually malevolent, raised its head profound or raised his head proudly in the midst of these trophies, biding the time to strike against the mirror like a procession. The photographs were arranged. These photographs were the true antiques of the family, which seemed to feel that a photograph should commemorable or a, a photograph should commemorate only the most distant past. The photographs of John and Roy and of the two girls, which seemed to violate this unspoken law, served only in fact to prove it most iron hard. They all had been taken in infancy, a time and a condition that the children could not remember. John and his photograph lay naked on a white counterpane, and people laughed and said that it was cunning. But John could never look at it without feeling shame and anger that his nakedness should be here so unkindly revealed. None of the other children was naked, nor Roy lay in his crib. 
No, Roy lay in his crib in a white gown and grinned toothlessly in the camera. And Sarah, somber at the age of six months, wore a white bonnet and Ruth was held in her mother's arms. Ruth was held in her mother's arms when people looked at these photographs and laughed. Their laughter differed from the laughter with which they greeted the naked John. For this reason, when visitors tried to make advances to John, he was sullen and they feeling that for some reason he disliked and retaliated by deciding that he was a funny child. Among the other photographs, there was one of Aunt Florence, his father's sister, in which her hair in the old-fashioned way was worn high and tied with the ribbon. She had been very young when this photograph was taken. He had just come north, Aunt Florence. Sometimes when she came to visit, she called the photograph to witness that she had indeed been beautiful in her youth. There was a photograph of his mother, not the one John liked, and had seen only once, but one taken immediately after her marriage. And there was a photograph of his father dressed in black, sitting on a country porch with his hands folded heavily in his lap. The photograph had been taken on a sunny day, and the sunlight brutally exaggerated the planes of his father's face. He stared into the sun, head raised, unbearable, <clears throat> and though it had been taken when he was young, it was not the face of a young man. Only something archaic in the dress indicated that his photograph had been taken long ago. <clears throat> At the time this picture was taken, Aunt Florence said he was already a preacher and had a wife who was now in heaven. That he had been a preacher at that time was not astonishing, for it was impossible to imagine that he had ever been anything else, but that he had had a wife in a so distant past who was now dead filled John with the wonder by no means pleasant. If she had lived, John thought, then he would never have been born. His father would have never come north and met his mother, and the shadowy woman dead so many years whose name he knew had been Deborah, held in the fastness of her tomb, it seemed to John, the key to all those mysteries he so longed to unlock. It was she who had known his father in a life where John was not and in a country John had never seen when he was nothing nowhere dust cloud air and sun and falling rain not even thought of said his mother in heaven with the angels said his aunt she known she had known his father and shared his father's house she had loved his father she had known his father when lightning flash or lightning flash and thunder rolled through heaven and his father said listen god is talking she had known him in the morning in the mornings of that far off country when his father turned on his bed and opened his eyes and she had looked into his those eyes seeing what they held and she had not been afraid she had seen him baptized kicking like a mule and howling and she had seen him weep when his mother died he was a right young man then florence said because she had looked into those eyes before they had looked on john and she knew what john would never know the purity of his father's eyes when john was not reflected in their depths she could have told them she could have told him had he but been able from his hiding place to ask how to make his father love him but now it was too late she would not speak before the judgment day among those many voices and stammering with his own john would care no longer for her testimony when he had finished and the room was ready for Sunday, John felt dusty and weary and sat down beside the window in his father's easy chair. A glacial sun filled the streets and a high wind filled the air with scraps of paper and frosty dust and banged the hanging signs of stores and storefront churches. It was the end of winter and the garbage-filled snow that had been banked along the edges of the sidewalks was melting now, filling the gutters. Boys were playing stickball in the damp, cold streets, dressed in heavy woolen sweaters and heavy pants. They danced and shouted and the ball went crack as the stick struck it and sank and sent it speeding through the air. One of them wore a bright red stocking cap with a great ball of wool hanging down behind that, bounced as he jumped like a bright omen above his head. The cold sun made their faces like copper and brass, and through the closed window John heard their coarse, irreverent voices, and he wanted to be one of them playing in the streets unfrightened, moving with such grace and power, but he knew this could not be. Yet if he could not play their games, he could do something they could not do. He was able, as one of his teachers said, to think. But this brought him little in the way of consolation, for today he was terrified of his thoughts. He wanted to be with these boys in the street, heedless and thoughtless, wearing out, wearing out his treacherous and bewildering body, but now it was 11 o'clock and in two hours his father would be home and then they might eat and then his father would lead them in prayer and then he would give them a bible lesson by and by it would be evening and he would go to clean the church and remain and remain for terry service Suddenly sitting at the window and with the violence unprecedented, there rose in John a flood of fury and tears and he bowed his head, fist clenched against the window pane, crying with teeth on edge, what shall I do, what shall I do? And his mother called him and he remembered that she was in the kitchen washing clothes and probably had something for him to do. He rose sullenly and walked into the kitchen. She stood over the wash tub, her arms wet and soapy to the elbows and sweat, standing on her brow, her apron improvised from an old sheet. She, she was wet where she had been leaning over the scrubbing board. As she came in, she strained, drying her hands on the edge of the apron. You finished your work john she asked he said yes some and thought how oddly she looked at him as though she were looking at someone else's child that's good boy she said she smiled a, a shy strained smile you know your mother's right hand man you know you're your mother's right hand man he said nothing and he did not smile but watched her wondering what task this preamble led she turned away passing one damp hand across her forehead and went to the cupboard her back was to him and she watched 
and he watched her while she took down a bright figured vase filled with flowers only on the most special occasions she emptied the contents into her palm here at the chink of money which meant that she was going to send him to the store she put the vase back and turned to face him her palm loosely folded before her i didn't never ask you she said what you wanted for your birthday but you take the son and you go out and get yourself something you think you want and she opened his palm and put the money into it warm and wet from her hand in the moment that he felt the warm smooth coins and her hand on his john stared blindly at her face so far above him his heart broke and he wanted to put his hand on her belly where the wet spot was and cried but he dropped his eyes and looked at his palm at the small pile of coins it ain't much there she said that's all right then he looked up and she bent down and kissed him on the forehead you getting to be she said putting her hand beneath his chin and holding his face away from her right big boy you're going to be a mighty fine man you know that your mom was counting on you and he knew again that she was not saying everything she meant in the kind of secret language she was telling him today something that he must remember and understand tomorrow he watched her face his heart swollen with love for her and with an anguish not yet his own that he did not understand and that frightened him yes ma he said hoping that she would realize despite his stammering tongue the depth of his passion to please her i know she said with a smile releasing him and rising there's a whole lot of things you don't understand but don't you fret the lord has revealed to you in his own good time everything he wants you to know you put your faith in the lord johnny and he'll sure bring you out everything works together for good for them that love the lord he had heard her say this before it was her text as set thine house in order was this he had heard her say this before. It was her text as set thine house in order was his father's, but he knew that today she was saying it to him especially. She was trying to help him because she knew he was in trouble, and this trouble was also her own, which she should which she would never tell to she would never tell to John. And even though he was certain that they could not be speaking of the same things for them. Surely she would be angry and no longer proud of him. This perception on her part and this avowal of her love for him lent to John's bewilderment reality that terrified him and a dignity that consoled him. Dimly, he felt that he ought to console her and he listened, astounded at the words that now fell from her lips. Yes, Mama, I'm going to try to love the Lord. At this, there sprang into his mother's face something startling, beautiful, unspeakably sad, as though she were looking far beyond him at a long, dark road and seeing on that road a traveler in perpetual danger. Was it he the traveler or herself, or was she, or was she thinking of the cross of Jesus? She turned back to the wash tub, still with this strange sadness on her face. You better go on now, she said, before your daddy gets home. In Central Park, the snow had not yet melted on his favorite hill. This hill was in the center of the park after he had left the circle of the reservoir where he always found outside the high wall of cross wire ladies, white and fur coats walking their great dogs or old white gentlemen with canes at a point that he knew by instinct and by the shape of the buildings surrounding the park. He struck out on a steep path overgrown with trees and climbed a short distance until he reached the clearing that led to the hill. Before him, before him then the slope stretched upward and above it the brilliant sky and beyond it cloudy and far away he saw the skyline of New York. He did not know why but there rose in him an exaltation in the sense of power and he ran up the hill like an engine or a madman willing to throw himself headlong into the city that glowed before him but when he reached the summit he paused he stood on the crest of the hill hands clasped beneath his chin looking down then he john felt like a giant who might crumble the city with his his anger he felt like a tyrant who might crush the city beneath this hill and he felt like a long-awaited conqueror at whose feet flowers would be strewn and before whom multitudes cried, Hosanna, he will be of all the mightiest, the most beloved, the Lord's anointed, and he will live in the shiny city, the shining city which his ancestors had seen with longing from far away, for it was his, the inhabitants of the city had told him it was his. He had but to run down crying. He had but to run down crying, and they would take him to their hearts and show him wonders his eyes had never seen. And still on the summit of that hill he paused. He remembered the people he had seen in that city whose eyes held no love for him, and he thought of, the, of their feet so swift and brutal in the dark gray clothes they wore, and how when they passed they did not see him, or if they saw him they smirked, and how their lights unceasing crashed on and off above, and how he was a stranger there. Then he remembered his father and his mother and all the arms stretched out to hold him back to save him from the city where they said his soul and would find perdition. And certainly perdition sucked at the feet of the people who walked there and cried in the lights and the gigantic towers and marks of saying could be found in the faces of the people who waited at the doors of movie houses. His words were printed on the great movie posters that invited people to sin. It was a roar of the damned that filled Broadway. It was a roar of the damned that filled Broadway, where motor cars and buses and the hurrying people disputed every inch with death. Broadway, the way that led to death, was broad, and many could be... And many could be found thereon, but narrow was the way that held to life eternal, and few there were who found it. But he did not long for the narrow way where all his people walked, where the houses did not rise, piercing as it seemed, the unchanging clouds, but huddled flat and noble, close to the filthy ground, where the streets and the hallways and the rooms were dark, and where the unconquerable odor was of dust and sweat and urine and homemade gin.
and the narrow way, the way of the cross, their way to him, only humiliation forever. Their way to him, one day, a house like his father's house, and a church like his father's, and a job like his father's, where he would grow old and black with hunger and toil. The way of the cross had given him a valley filled with the wind and had bent his mother's back. They had never worn fine clothes, but there where the buildings contested God's power, and, and the men and women did not fear God. Here he might eat and drink to his heart's content and clothe his body with wondrous fabrics, rich to the eye and pleasing to the touch. And then what, what of his soul, which would one day come to die and stand naked before the judgment bar what would his conquest of the cities profit him on the day to hurl away for a moment of ease the glories of eternity these glories were unimaginable but the city was real he stood for a moment on the melting snow distracted and then began to run down the hill feeling feeling himself fly as a dis as the descent became more rapid, and thinking I can climb back up. If it's wrong, I can always climb back up. At the bottom of the hill where the ground abruptly leveled off onto a gravel path, he nearly knocked down an old white man with a white beard who was walking very slowly and leaning on this cane. They both stopped, astonished, and looked at one another. John struggled to catch his breath and apologized, but the old man smiled. John smiled back. It was as though he and the old man had between them a great secret and the old man moved on the snow glittered in patches all over the park ice under the pale strong sun melted slowly on the branches and the trunks of trees he came out of the park at fifth avenue where as always the old-fashioned horse carriages were lined along the curb the drivers sitting on high seats with rugs around their knees are standing in twos and threes near the horses stamping their feet and smoking pipes and talking in summer he had seen people riding in these carriages looking like people out of books or out of movies in which everyone wore old-fashioned clothes and rushed at night fall rushed at nightfall over frozen roads hotly pursued by their enemies who wanted to carry them back to death look back look back had cried a beautiful woman with long blonde curls and see if we are all pursued see if we are pursued and she had come as john remembered to a terrible end now we stared at the horses enormous and brown and patient stamping every now and again a polished hoof and he thought of what it would be like to have one day a horse of his own he would call it rider and mount it at morning when the grass was wet and from the horse's back look out over great sun filled sun fields his own behind him stood his house gray and rambling and very new and in the kitchen his wife a beautiful woman made breakfast made breakfast and the smoke rose out of the chimney melting into the morning air they had children who called him papa and for whom at christmas he bought electric trains and he had turkeys and cows and chickens and geese and other horses besides rider they had a closet full of whiskey and wine they had cars but what church did they go to and what would he teach his children when they gathered what would he teach his children when they gathered around him in the evening hold on guys He looked straight ahead down Fifth Avenue where graceful women in fur coats walked, looking into the windows that held silk dresses and watches and rings. What church did they go to? And what were their houses like when in the evening they took off these coats and these silk dresses and put their jewelry in a box and leaned back in soft beds to think for a moment before they slept of the day gone by? Did they read a verse from the Bible every night and fall on their knees to pray? But no, for their thoughts were not of God, and their ways was not God's way. They were in the world and of the world, and their feet laid hold on hell. Yet in school, some of them had been nice to him, and it was hard to think of them burning in hell forever. They were so gracious and beautiful now. Once, one winter when he had been very sick with a heavy cold that would not leave him one of these one of his teachers had brought him a bottle of cod liver oil especially prepared with heavy syrup so that it did not taste so bad this was surely a christian act his mother had said that god would let would bless that woman and he had got better they were kind he was sure that they were kind and on that day that he would bring himself to their attention they would surely love and honor him this was not his father's opinion his father said that all white people were wicked and that god was going to bring them low he said that white people were never to be trusted and that they told nothing but lies and that not not one of them had ever loved the uh, n-word he he john was an n-word he would find out as soon as he got a little older how evil white people would be john had read about the things white people did to colored people how in the south where his parents came from white people cheated them of their wages and burned them he shot them or and shot them and did worse things said his father which the tongue could not endure to utter he had read about colored men being burned in the electric chair for things they had not done how in riots they were beaten with clubs how they were tortured in prisons how they were the last to be hired and the first to be fired n-words did not live on these streets where john now walked it was 
forbidden, yet he walked here, and no one raised a hand against him, but did he dare to enter his, enter the shop out of which a woman not casually walked, carrying a great round box, or this apartment before which a white man stood dressed in a brilliant uniform. John knew he did not dare, not today, and he heard his father's laugh. No, nor tomorrow, neither for him. There was the back door, and the dark stairs, and the kitchen, or the basement. This world was not for him. If he refused to believe and wanted to break his neck trying, then he could try until the sun refused to shine. They would never let him enter. In John's mind then, the people in the avenue underwent a change, and he feared them, and he knew that one day he could hate them if God did not change his heart. He left Fifth Avenue and walked west towards the movie houses. Here on 42nd Street, it was less elegant, but no less strange. He loved this street, not for the people or the shops, but for the for the stone lions that guarded the great main building of the public library, a building filled with books and unimaginably vast, in which he had never yet dared to enter. He might, he knew, for he was a member of the branch in Harlem and was entitled to take books from library and from any library in the city, but he had never gone in because the building was so big that it must be full of corridors and marble steps in the maze of which he would be lost and never find the book he wanted and then everyone all the white people inside would know that he was hold on i know that he was this is a long chapter so i'm gonna just just i'm gonna it comes in um parts so i'm on page 36 this uh this one ends on 65 so bear with me um uh, so it says what does it say and then everyone all the white people inside would know that he was not used to great buildings or many books and they would look at him with pity he would enter on another day when he had read all the books uptown an achievement that would he felt lend him the poise to enter any building in the world people mostly men leaned over the stone parapets of the raised park that surrounded the library or walked up and down and bent to drink water from the public drinking fountains silver pigeons lighted brightly on the heads of the lions or the rims of the fountains and strutted along the walks john loitered in front of woolworth's staring at the candy display trying to decide what candy to buy and buying none for the store was crowded and he was certain that the sales girl would never notice him and before a vendor of artificial flowers and crossed sixth avenue where the automat was in the parked taxis in the shops which you would not look at today that displayed in the windows dirty postcards and practical jokes beyond sixth avenue the movie houses began and now we study the stills carefully trying to decide which of all these theaters he should enter he stopped at the last before a gigantic colored poster that represented a wicked woman half undressed leaning in a doorway apparently quarreling with a blonde man who started wretchedly into the street the legend above their heads was there's a fool like him in every family and a woman next door to take him over he decided to see this for he felt identified with a blonde young man the fool of his family and he wished to know more about this so blatantly unkind fate and so he stared at the price above the ticket seller's window and showing her his coins received a piece of paper that was charged with the power to open doors having once decided to enter he did not look back at the street again for fear that one of the saints might be passing and seeing him might cry out his name and lay hands on him to drag him back he walked very quickly across the carpeted lobby looking at nothing and pausing only to see his ticket torn half of it thrown into a silver box and half returned to him and then the usherette opened the doors of this dark palace and with a flashlight held behind him behind her took him to his seat not even then having pushed past the wilderness of knees and feet to reach his designated seat did he dare to breathe nor out of a last sick hope for forgiveness did he look at the screen he stared at the darkness around him and at the profiles that gradually emerged from his gloom which was so like the gloom of hell he waited for this darkness to be shattered by the light of the second coming for the ceiling to crack upward revealing for every eye to see the chariots of fire which descended a wrathful god and all the hosts of heaven he sank far down in his seat as though his crouching might make him invisible and deny his presence there but then he thought not yet the day of judgment is not yet and voices reached him the voices no doubt of the hapless man and the evil woman and he raised his eyes helplessly and watched the screen. The woman was most evil. She was blind and pasty white, and she had lived in London, which was in England, quite some time ago, judging from her clothes, and she coughed. He had a terrible disease. She had a terrible disease, tuberculosis, which he had heard about. Someone in his mother's Someone in his mother's family had died of it. She had a great many boyfriends and she smoked cigarettes and drank. When she met the young man who was a student and who loved her very much, she was very cruel to him. She laughed at him because he was a cripple. She took his money and she went out with the other man and she lied to the student who was certainly a fool. He limped the belt looking soft and sad. He limped the belt looking soft and sad and soon all John, all of John's sympathy was given to this violent and unhappy woman. He understood her when she raged and shook her lips and threw back her head and laughed her so furious that it seemed the veins of her neck would burst. She walked the cold, foggy streets, a little woman and not pretty with 
a lewd, brutal swagger, saying to the whole world, you can kiss my ass. Nothing tamed or broke her, nothing touched her, neither kindness nor scorn nor hatred nor love. She had never thought of prayer. It was unimaginable that she would ever bend her knees and come crawling along a dusty floor to anybody's altar, weeping for forgiveness. Perhaps her sin was so extreme that it could not be forgiven. Perhaps her pride was so great that she did not need forgiveness. She had fallen from the highest state which God had intended for men and women, and she made her fall glorious because it was so complete. John could not have found in his heart, had he dared to search it, any wish for her redemption. He wanted to be like her, not only more powerful, more thorough, and more cruel to make those around him, all who hurt him, suffer it, as she made the students suffer and laugh in their faces when they asked pity for their pain. He would have asked no pity, and his pain was greater than theirs. Go on, girl, he whispered as a student, facing her facing her implacable ill will sighed and wept go on girl one day he would talk like that he would face them and tell them how much he hated them how they had made him suffer how he would pay them back nevertheless when she came to die which she did eventually looking more grotesque than ever as she deserved his thoughts were abruptly arrested and he was chilled by the expression on her face she seemed to stare endlessly outward and down in the face of a wind more piercing than any she had left on earth feeling propelled with speed into a kingdom where nothing could help her neither her pride nor her courage nor her glorious wickedness in the place where she was going it was not these things that mattered but something else for which she had no name only a cold only a cold intimation something that she could not alter in any degree and that she had never thought of she began to cry her depraved face breaking into an infant's grimace and they moved away from her leaving her dirty in a dirty room alone to face her maker the scene faded out and she was gone and though the movie went on allowing the student to marry another girl darker and very sweet but by no means so arresting john thought of this woman and her dreadful end Again, had the thought not been blasphemous, he would have thought that it was the Lord who had led him into this theater to show him an example of the wages of sin. The movie ended and people stirred around him. The newsreel came on. And while girls in the bathing suits paraded before him and boxers growled and fought and basketball players ran home safe and presidents and kings of countries that were only names to him moved briefly across the flickering square of light. John thought of hell, of his soul's redemption, and struggled to find a compromise between the way that led to life everlasting and the way that ended into the pit. But there was none, for he had been raised in the truth. He could not claim, as African savages might be able to claim, that no one had brought him to the gospel. His father and mother and all the saints had taught him from the earliest childhood what was the will of God. Either he arose from this theater, never to return, putting behind him the world and its pleasures, its honors and its glories, or he remained here with the wicked and partook of their certain punishment. Yes, it was a narrow way. And John, it was a narrow way. And John stirred in his seat, not daring to feel it. God's injustice that he must make so cruel a choice. Not daring to feel it, God's injustice that he must make so cruel a choice. As John approached his home again in the late afternoon, he saw little Sarah, her, curt, her coat unbuttoned, come flying out of the house and run the length of the street away from him into the far drugstore. Instantly, he was frightened. He stopped the moment, staring blankly down the street, wondering what could justify such hysterical haste. It was true that Sarah was full of self-importance and made any errand she ran seem a matter of life or death. Nevertheless, she had been sent on an errand and with such speed that her mother had not had time to make her button up her coat. <clears throat> then he felt weary. If something had really happened, it would be very unpleasant upstairs now. And he did not want to face it, but perhaps it was simply that his mother had a headache and had sent Sarah to the store for some aspirin. But if this were true, it meant that he would have to prepare supper and take care of the children and be naked under his father's eyes all evening long. And he began to walk more slowly. There were some boys standing on the stoop. They watched him as he approached and he tried not to look at them and to approximate the swagger with which they walked. One of them said as he mounted the short stone steps and started into the hall boy your brother was hurt real bad today he looked at them in a kind of dread not daring to ask for details and he observed that they too looked as though they had been in a battle something something hang dog in their in their looks suggested that they had been put to fight then he looked down and saw that there was blood at the threshold and blood spattered on the towel floor of the vestibule he looked again at the boys who had not ceased to watch him and hurried up the stairs the door was half open for sarah's return no doubt and he walked in making no sound feeling the confused impulse to flee there was no one in the kitchen though the light was burning the lights were on all through the house on the kitchen table stood a shopping bag filled with groceries and he knew that his aunt florence had arrived the wash tub where his mother had been washing earlier was open still and filled the kitchen with the sour smell there were drops of blood on the floor here too and there had been small smudged coins of blood on the stairs as he walked up 
all this frightened him terribly. He stood in the middle of the kitchen trying to imagine what had happened and preparing himself to walk in the living room where all the family seemed to be. Roy had been in trouble before, but this new trouble seemed to be the beginning of the fulfillment of a, prop of a prophecy. He took off his coat, dropping it on a chair, and was about to start into the living room when he heard Sarah running up the steps. He waited, and she burst through the door, carrying a clumsy parcel. What happened? He whispered. She stared at him in astonishment and a certain wild joy. He thought again that he really did not like his sister catching her breath. She blurted out triumphantly. Roy got stabbed with the knife and rushed into the living room. Roy got stabbed with the knife. Whatever this man was sure that his father would be at his worst tonight. John walked slowly into the living room. His father and mother, a small basin of water between, a small basin of water between, between them. Now by the sofa where Roy lay, and his father was washing the blood from Roy's forehead. It seemed that his mother, whose whose uh, touch was so much more gentle, had been thrust aside by his father, who could not bear to have anyone else touch his w wounded son. And now she watched, one hand in the water, the other in a kind of anguish at her, at her waist, which was circled, which was circled still by improvised apron of the morning, by the improvised apron in the morning. Her face, as she watched, was full of pain and fear, of tension barely supported, and a pity that could scarcely have been expressed as she filled all the world with her weeping. His father muttered sweet, delirious things to Roy in his hands when he dipped them again in his basin, wrung out the cloth with trembling. Aunt Florence, still wearing her hat and carrying her handbag, stood a little removed, looking down at them with a troubled, terrible face. And Sarah bounded into the room before him, and his mother looked up, reached out for the package, and saw him. She said nothing, but she looked at him with a strange, quick intentness, almost as though there were a warning on her tongue which at that moment she did not dare utter. His Aunt Florence looked up and said, we've been wondering where you was, boy. This bad brother of yours then got out and got himself hurt. But John understood from her tone that the fuss was possibly a little greater than the danger. Roy was not, after all, going to die, and his heart lifted a little. Then his father turned and looked at him. Where you been, boy, he shouted all this time. Don't you know you's need? Don't you know you's needed here at the house? Or don't you know you's needed here at home? More than his words, his face caused John to stiffen instantly with malice and fear. His father's face was terrible and angry, but now there was more than anger in it. John saw now what he had never seen before, except in his own vindictive fantasies, a kind of wild, weeping terror that made the face seem younger, and yet at the same time, unutterably older and more cruel. And John knew in, in the moment his father's eyes swept over him that he hated John because John was not lying on the sofa where Roy lay. John could scarcely meet his father's eyes, and yet briefly he did say nothing, feeling in his heart an odd sensation of triumph and hoping in his heart that Roy, to bring his father low, would die. His mother had unwrapped the package and was opening a bottle of peroxide. Here she said, you better wash it. With this now, her voice was calm and dry. She looked at his father briefly, her face unreadable as she handed him the bottle and the cotton. It's going to hurt, his father said in such a different voice, so sad and tender. Turning again to the sofa, will you just be a little man and hold still? It ain't going to take too long. John watched and listened, hating him. Roy began to moan. Aunt Florence moved to the mantelpiece and put her hand back down near the metal serpent. From the room behind him, John heard the baby begin to whimper. John said his mother, go and pick her up like a good boy. Her hands, which were not trembling, were still busy. She had opened the bottle of iodine and was cutting up strips of bandage. John walked into his parents' bedroom and picked, the, picked up the squalling baby who was, who was wet. The moment Ruth felt him lift her up, she stopped crying and stared at him with a wide-eyed, pathetic stare as though she knew that there was trouble in the house. John laughed at her so ancient, seeming distress. John laughed at her so ancient seeming distress. He was very fond of his baby sister and whispered in her ear as he started back to the living room. Now you let your big brother tell you. Now you let your big brother tell you, tell you something, baby. Just as soon as you was able to stand on your feet, you run away from this house, run far away. He did not quite know why he had said this or where he wanted her to run, but it made him feel instantly better. His father was saying as John came back into the room, I'm sure you're going to be having some questions to ask. I'm sure going to be having some questions to ask you in a minute, old lady. I'm going to be wanting to know just how come you let this boy go out and get killed or, or get half killed. Oh, no, you wait, said Aunt Florence. You ain't going to be starting none of that mess this evening. You know right doggone well that Roy don't ever ask nobody if he can do nothing. He just go right ahead and do like he pleases. Elizabeth sure can't put no ball and chain on him. She got her hands full right here in the house. And it ain't her fault if Roy got a head just as hard as his father's. You got an awful lot to say. Look like for once you could keep from putting your mouth in my business, he said this without looking at her. It ain't my fault, she said. You was born a fool and always done been a fool and never going to change. I swear to my father, you tried the patience of Job. I swear to my father, you tried the patience of Job. I done told you before, he said, he had not ceased working over the moaning, Roy, and was appearing now to dab the wound with iodine. I didn't want you coming in here using that gutter language in front of my children. Don't you worry about my language, brother, she said with spirit. You better start worrying about your life. What these children here ain't going to do. What these children here ain't going to do them near as much harm as they, as what they see. 
what they see is father muttered as a poor man trying to serve the lord that's my life and I guarantee you, she said, are they going to do their best to keep it from being their life? You mark my words. She turned and looked at her. She turned. He, he turned and looked at her and intercepted the look that passed between the two women. John's mother, for reasons that were not at all his father's reasons, wanted Aunt Florence to keep still. He looked away, ironically. John watched his mother's mouth tighten bitterly as she dropped her eyes. His father, in silence, began bandaging Roy's forehead. It's just the mercy of God, he said at last, that this boy didn't lose his eye. Look here. His mother leaned over and looked into Roy's face with a sad, sympathetic murmur. Yet John felt she had seen instantly the extent of the danger to Roy's eye and to his life and was beyond that worry now. Now she was merely marking time as it were and preparing herself against the moment when her husband's anger would turn full force against her. His father now turned to John who was standing near the French doors with Ruth in his arms. You come here, boy, he said, and see what them white folks done done to your, your brother. John walked over to the sofa holding himself as proudly beneath his father's furious eyes as a prince approaching the scaffold. Look here, said his father, grasping him roughly by one arm. Look at your brother. John looked at Roy, who gazed at him with almost no expression in his dark eyes, but John knew by the weary and patient set of Roy's young mouth that his brother was asking that none of this be held against him. It wasn't his fault or John's. It wasn't his fault or John's, Roy's eyes said, that they had such a crazy father. His father with the air of his father, with the air of one forcing the sinner to look down in the pit that is to be his portion, moved away slightly so that John could see Roy's wound. Roy had been gashed by a knife, luckily not very sharp, from the center of his forehead, where his hair began downward to the bone just above his eye. The wound described a crazy kind of half-moon and ended in a violent, fuzzy tail that was a ruin of Roy's eyebrow. Time would darken the half-moon wound into Roy's dark skin, but nothing would bring together again the so violently divided eyebrow. This crazy lift, this question, would remain with him forever and emphasize forever something mocking and sinister in Roy's face. John felt a sudden impulse to smile, but his father's eyes were on him and he fought the impulse back. Certainly the wound was now very ugly and very red and must, John felt, with the quick and sympathy towards Roy, who had not cried out, had been very painful. You can imagine the sensation caused when Roy staggered into the house, blinded by his blood, but just the same, he wasn't dead, he wasn't changed, he would be in the streets again the moment he was better. You see, he came now from his father, it was white folks, some of them white folks, you like so much that try to cut your brother's throat john thought with immediate anger and with a curious contempt for his father's inexactness that only a blind man however white could possibly have been aiming at roy's throat and his mother said with the calm insistence and he was trying to cut theirs him and them bad boys yes said aunt florence i heard you ask that boy nary a question about how all this happened looked like you just determined to raise cain anyhow and make everybody in this house suffer because something done happened to the apple of your eye i done ask you cried his father in a fearful, exas in a fearful exasperation stop running your mouth don't none of this concern you this is my family this is my house you want me to slap your side of the head slap your side of the head you slap me she said with a pla uh, with a placidity equally fearful and I do guarantee you, you won't do no more slapping in a hurry. Hush now, said his mother, rising. Ain't no need for all this. What's done is done. We ought to be on our knees, thanking the Lord it weren't no worse. Amen to that, said Aunt Florence. Tell that foolish N-word something. You can tell that foolish son of yours something, he said to his wife with the venom. Having decided to seem to ignore his sister, him standing there with them big buckeyes. You could tell him to take this like a warning from the Lord. This is what the white folks does to N-words. I've been telling you now, you see. He better take it like a warning, shrieked Aunt Florence. He better take it. Why, Gabriel, it ain't him went halfway across the city to get in a fight with white boys. This boy on the sofa went deliberately with a whole lot of other boys all the way to the west side just looking for a fight. I declare, I do wonder what goes on in your head. You know right well, his mother said, looking directly at his father, that Johnny don't travel with the same class of boys as Roy goes with. You don't beat Roy too many times here in this very room for going out with them bad boys. Roy got himself hurt this afternoon because he was out doing something he didn't have no didn't have no business doing and that's the end of it you ought to be thanking your redeemer he ain't dead and for all the care you take care of him for all the care you take care of him he said he might as well be dead don't look like you much care whether he lives or dies lord have mercy said aunt florence he's my son too his mother said with heat i carried him in my belly for nine months and i know him just like i know his daddy and they just exactly alike now you ain't got no right in the world to talk to me like that i reckon you know he said choked and breathing hard all about mother's love i sure reckon on you telling me how a woman can sit in the house all day and let her own flesh and blood go out and get half butchered don't you tell me you don't uh, don't tell me you don't know no way to stop him because i remember my mother god rest her soul and she'd have she'd have found a way 
She was my mother too, said Aunt Florence, and I recollect if you don't, you being brought home many a time more dead than alive. She didn't find no way to stop you. She wore herself out beating on you, just like you've been wearing yourself out beating on this boy here. My, 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 he said, you got a lot to say. It ain't doing a thing, she said, but trying to talk someone some sense into your big black hard head. You better stop trying to blame everything on Elizabeth and look for your own wrongdoings. Never mind, Florence, his mother said. It's all over and done, done now. I'm out of this house, he shouted. Every day the Lord sends working to put the food in these children's mouths. Don't you think I got a right to ask the mother of these children to look after them and see that they don't break their necks before I get back home? You ain't got but one child, she said, that's liable to go out and break his neck, and that's Roy, and you know it. And I don't know how in the world you expect me to run this house and look after these children and keep running around the block after Roy. No, I can't stop him. I done told you that, and you can't stop him either. You don't know what to do with this boy, and that's why you all the time trying to fix the blame on somebody. Ain't nobody to blame, Gabriel. You just better pray God to stop him before somebody puts another knife in his head and puts him in his grave or puts another knife in him and puts him in his grave. They stared at each other a moment in an awful pause. She was a startled, pleading question in her eyes. Then with all his might, he reached out and slapped her across the face. She, she crumpled at once, hiding her face with one thin hand, and now Florence moved to hold her up. Sarah watched all this with greedy eyes. Then Roy sat up and said in a shaking voice, Don't you slap my mother. That's my mother. You slap her again, you black bastard. And I swear, oh God, I'll kill you. I swear to God, I'll kill you. And the moment that these words filled the room and hung in the room like the infinitesimal moment, inf infinite, infinitesimal, I-N-F-I-N-I-T-E-S-I-M-A-L. Infinitesimal? Okay. In the moment, <laughs> there's a bunch of ants. Feel them on me. All right, so it says this, um, in the moment that these words filled the room and hung in the room like the infinitesimal moment of hanging, jagged light that precedes an explosion, John and his father were staring into, into each other's eyes. John thought for that moment that his father believed the words had come from him. His eyes were so wild and depthlessly malevolent, and his mouth was twisted in such a snarl of pain. And in the absolute silence that followed Roy's words, John saw that his father was not seen and was not seen anything unless it were a vision. John wanted to turn and flee as though he had encountered in the jungle some evil beast, crouching and ravenous with eyes with eyes like hell unclosed and exactly as though on a road's turning he found himself staring at certain destruction he found that he could not move then his father turned and looked down at roy what did you say his father asked i told you said roy not to touch my mother you cursed me said his father roy said nothing neither did he drop his eyes gabriel said his mother gabriel let us pray his father's hands were at his waist and he took off his belt tears were in his eyes gabriel cried out florence and you done playing the fool for tonight and his father raised his belt and it fell with the whistling sound on Roy who shivered and fell back his face to the wall. We did not cry out and the bell was raised again and again. The air rang with the whistling and the crack against Roy's flesh and the baby Ruth began to scream. My Lord, my Lord, his father whispered, my Lord, my Lord. He raised the belt again, but Aunt Florence caught it from behind and held it. His mother rushed over to the sofa and caught Roy in her arms, crying as John had never seen a woman or anybody cry before. Roy caught his mother around the neck and held on to her as though she were drowning. His Aunt Florence and his father faced each other. Yes, Lord, Aunt Florence said, you was born wild and you was going to die wild, but ain't no use trying to take the whole world with you. You can't change nothing, Gabriel. You have to know that by now. Then talking about the dad, right? John opened the church door with his father's key at six o'clock. Terry's service officially began at eight, but it could begin at any time whenever the Lord moved, moved one of the saints to enter the church and pray. It was seldom, however, that anyone arrived before 8.30. The Spirit of the Lord being sufficiently tolerant to allow the saints time to do their Saturday night shopping, clean their houses, and put their children to bed. John closed the door behind him and stood in the narrow church aisle, hearing behind him the voices of children playing and the ruder voices, the voices of the elders cursing and crying in the streets. It was dark in the church. Street lights had been snapping on all around them on the populous avenue. The light of the day was gone. His feet seemed planted on this wooden floor. They did not wish to carry him one step further. The darkness and the silence of the church pressed on. Cold as judgment and the voices crying from the window might have been crying from another world. John moved forward, hearing his feet crack against the sagging wood to where the golden cross on the red foot of the altar cloth glowed like smothered fire and switched on one weak light. In the air of the church hung perpetually the odor of dust and sweat, for like the carpet in his mother's living room, the dust of this church was invincible. And when the saints were praying and rejoicing, their bodies gave off an acrid, steamy smell, a marriage of odors of dripping bodies and soaking, starched white linen. It was a storefront church and had stood for John's lifetime on the corner of this awful avenue, facing the hospital to which criminal wounded and dying were carried almost every night. The saints arriving had rented this abandoned store and taken out the fixtures, had painted the walls and built a pulpit, moved into a piano 
or moved in moved in a piano in camp and camp chairs and bought the biggest Bible they could find. They put white curtains in the show window and painted across the window, Temple of the Fire Baptized. And they were ready to do the Lord's work. And the Lord, as he had promised to the two or three first gathered together, sent others and these brought others and created a church from this parent branch. If the Lord bless, other branches might grow and a mighty work to uh, be begun throughout the city and throughout the land. In the history of the temple, the Lord had raised up evangelists and the teachers and the prophets and called them out into the field to do his work, to go up and down the land carrying the gospel or to raise other temples in Philadelphia, Georgia, Boston, or Brooklyn. Wherever the Lord led, they followed. Every now and again, one of them came home to testify of the wonders the Lord had worked through him or her. And sometimes on a special Sunday, they all visited one of the nearer churches of the brotherhood. There had been a time before John was born when his father had also been in the field, but now, having to earn for his family their daily bread, it was seldom that he was able to travel further away than Philadelphia, and only for a very short time. His father, no longer as he had once done, led great revival meetings. His name printed large on placards that advertised the coming of a man of God. His father had once had a mighty reputation, but all this has seemed that changed since he had left the South. Perhaps he ought now to have a church of his own. John wondered if his father wanted that. He ought perhaps to be leading as Father James now led a great flock to the kingdom, but his father was only a caretaker in the house of God. He was, he was responsible for the replacement of burnout light bulbs and for the cleanliness of the church and the care of the Bibles and the hymn books and the placards on the walls. On Friday night, he conducted the young minister's service and preached with them. Rarely did he bring the message on a Sunday morning, only if there was no one else to speak was his father called upon. He was a kind of filling speaker, a holy handyman. Yet he was treated so far as John could see with great respect. No one, none of the saints in any case, had ever reproached or rebuked his father or suggested that this life was anything but spotless. That his life was anything but spotless. Nevertheless, this man, God's minister, had struck John's mother and John had wanted to kill him and wanted to kill him still. John had swept one side of the church and the chairs were still piled in the space before the altar where there was a knocking at the door. When he opened the door, he saw that it was Alicia come to help him. Praise the Lord, said Alicia, standing on the door, step grinning. Praise the Lord, said John. This was a greeting always used among the saints. Brother Alicia came in, slamming the door behind him and stamping his feet. He had probably just come from a basketball court. His forehead was polished with recent sweat, and as his hair stood up, he was wearing his green woolen sweater on which he was st stamped the letter of his high school, and his shirt was open at the throat. You ain't cold like that, John asked, staring at him. No, little brother, I ain't cold. You reckon everybody's frail like you? Hey, only the little ones get carried to the graveyard, John said. He felt unaccustomedly bold and lighthearted. The arrival of Elisha, the, the arrival of Elisha, had caused his mood to change. Elisha, who had started down the aisle toward the back room, turned to stare at John with astonishment and menace. Oh, he said, I see you fixing to be sassy with Brother Elisha tonight. I'm going to have to give you a little correction. You just wait till I wash my hands. Ain't no need to wash your hands if you come here to work. Just take hold of that mop and put some soap and water in the bucket. Lord, said Elisha, running water into the sink and talking and seeming to the water. That sure is a sassy N-word out there. I sure hope he don't get himself hurt one of these days, running his mouth that way. Look like he just won't stop till somebody busts his eye and busts him in the eye. He sighed deeply and began to lather his hands. Here I come running all the way so he went and bust the gut lifting one of them chairs and all he got to say is put some water in the bucket. Can't do anything with the N-word, some know-how. Can't do anything with an N-word, know-how. I'm saying N-word instead, instead of saying N-I-G-G-E-R. Um, uh, no how he stopped and turned to face john and you got no manners boy you better learn how to talk to old folks you better get out of here with that mop and pail we ain't got all night keep on said alicia i see i'm going to have to give you your lumps tonight he disappeared john heard him in the toilet and then over the thunderous water you heard him you heard him knocking things over in the back room now what are you doing boy leave me alone i'm fixing the work it sure sounds like it john dropped his broom and walked into the back alicia had knocked over a pile of camp chairs folded in the corner and stood over them angrily holding the mop in his hand. I keep telling you not to hide that mop back there. Can nobody get at it? I always get at it. Ain't, no, ain't everybody as clumsy as you. Alicia let fall the stiff gray mop and rushed at John, catching him off balance and lifting him from the floor. With bones, both arms tightening around John's waist, he tried to cut John's breath, watching him meanwhile with a smile that, as John struggled and squirmed, became a set ferocious grimace. With both hands, John pushed and pounded against the shoulders and biceps of Alicia and tried to thrust with his knees against Alicia's belly. Usually such a battle was soon over since Alicia was so much bigger and stronger and as the rest was so much more skill, but tonight John was filled with the determination not to be conquered, or at least to make the conquest dear. 
With all strength that was in him, he fought against Alicia, and he was filled with strength that was almost hatred. He kicked, pounded, twisted, pushed, using his lack of size to confound and exasperate Alicia, whose damp fist, joined at the small of John's back, soon slipped. It was a deadlock. He could not tie in his hold. John could not break it. So they turned, battling in the narrow room, and the odor of Alicia's sweat was heavy on John's nostrils. In John's nostrils, he saw the veins rise on Alicia's forehead and in his neck. His breath became jagged and harsh, and the grimace on his face became more cruel. And John, watching these manifestations of his power, was filled with a wild delight. They stumbled against the folding chairs, and Alicia's foot slipped and his hold broke. They stared at each other, half grinning. John slumped to the floor, holding his head between his hands. I didn't hurt you none, did I? Alicia asked. John looked up. Me? No, I just want to catch my breath. Alicia went to the sink and splashed cold water on his face and neck. I reckon you're going to let me work now, he said. It wasn't me that stopped you in the first place. He stood up. He found that his legs were trembling. He looked at Alicia, who was drying himself on the towel. You teach me wrestling one day, okay? No, boy, Alicia said, laughing. I don't want to wrestle with you. You're too strong for me. He began to run hot water into the great pail. John walked past him to the front, picked up his broom. In a moment, Alicia followed and began mopping near the door. John had finished sweeping, and he now mounted to the pulpit to dust the three uh, throne-like chairs, people with white linen squares for the headpieces and for the massive arms. A purple with white linen squares for the headpieces and for the massive arms. It dominated all the pulpit, a wooden platform raised above the congregation with a high stand in the center for a Bible before which the preacher stood. There faced the congregation flowing downward from this height, the scarlet altar cloth that bore the golden cross and the legend, Jesus saves. The pulpit was holding, no one could stand so high unless God's seal was on him. He dusted the piano and sat down on the piano stool to wait until Alicia had finished mopping one side of the church and he could replace the chairs. Suddenly, Alicia said without looking at him, Boy, ain't it time you was thinking about your soul? I guess so, John said with the quietness that terrified him. I know it looks hard, said Alicia, from the outside, especially when you're young. But you believe me, boy, you can't find no greater joy than you find in the service of the Lord. John said nothing. He touched a black key on the piano and it made a dull sound like a distant drum. You got to remember, Alicia said, turning out to look at him, that you think about it with the carnal mind. You still got Adam's mind, boy, and you keep thinking about your friends. You want to do what they do and you want to go to the movies. And I bet you think about girls, don't you, Johnny? Sure you do, he said, half smiling, finally his an finding his answer in John's voice. So you you don't want to give up all that but when the lord saves you he burns out all that old adam he gives you a new mind and a new heart and you don't find no pleasure in the world you get all your joy in walking and talking with jesus every day he, he stared in a dual paralysis of, of terror at the body of alicia he saw him standing had alicia forgotten beside alame before the altar while father james rebuked him for the evil that lived in his flesh he looked into alicia's eyes full of questions he would never ask and alicia's face told him nothing people say it's hard said alicia bending again to his mop but let me tell you in his heart as living in this wicked world and all the sadness of the world where there ain't no pleasure no how and then dying and going to hell anything as hard as that and he looked back at john you see how the devil tricks people into losing their souls Yes, said John at last, sounding almost angry, unable to bear his thoughts, unable to bear the silence in which Alicia looked at him. Alicia grinned, uh, Alicia grinned, E-L-I-S-H-A, Alicia, -E Alicia grinned. They got girls in the school I go to. He was finished with one side of the church, and he motioned to John to replace the chairs. And, and they nice girls, but their minds ain't, ain't on the Lord. And I tried to tell them. The time to repent ain't tomorrow, it's today. They think ain't no sense to worrying now. They can sneak into heaven on their deathbed. But I tell them, honey, ain't everybody lies down to die. People going all the time just like that. The day you see them and tomorrow you don't, boy. They don't know what to make of the old Alicia because he don't go to movies and he don't dance and he don't play cards and he don't go with them behind the stairs. He paused and stared at John who watched them helplessly not knowing what to say. And boy, some of them is real nice girls. I mean, beautiful girls. And when you got so much power that they don't tempt you, that you know you saved, sure enough. I just look at them and tell them, Jesus saved me one day and I'm going to go all the way with him. Ain't no woman nor no man neither going to make me change my mind. He paused again and smiled and dropped his eyes. That Sunday, he said, that Sunday, you remember when Father got up into the pulpit and called me and Alan May down because he thought we was about to commit sin. Wow, boy. I don't want to tell no lie. I was mighty hot against the old man that Sunday, but I thought about it. And the Lord made me to see that he was right. Me and Alan May, we didn't have nothing on our minds at all, but looked like the devil was just everywhere. Sometimes the devil, he put his hand on you and looked like you just can't breathe. Looked like you just are burning up and you got to do something. And you can't do nothing. I've been on my knees many a time, weeping and wrestling before the Lord, crying, Johnny, and calling on Jesus' name. That's the only name that's got power over saying. That's the way it's been with me some time and I'm saved. What do you think it's going to be like for you, boy? He looked at John whose head was down, was putting the chairs in order. Do you want to be saved, Johnny? I don't know, John. 
John said. Will you try him? Just fall on your knees one day and ask him to help you to pray. John turned away and looked out over the over the church, which now seemed like a vast high field ready for the harvest. He thought of a first Sunday, a communion Sunday, not long ago when the saints, not long ago when the saints dressed all in white, ate flat, unsalted Jewish bread, which was the body of the Lord, and drank red grape juice, which was his blood. And when they rose from the table prepared especially for this day, they separated the men on one side and the women on the other, and two basins were filled with water with water so they could wash each other's feet, as Christ had commanded his disciples to do. They knelt before each other, women before women, and man before man, and washed and dried each other's feet. Brother Relisha had knelt before John's father when the service was over they kissed each other with the holy kiss john turned again and looked at elisha elisha looked at him and smiled you think about what i said boy when they were finished elisha sat down at the piano and played to himself john sat on a chair in the front row and watched him don't look like nobody's coming tonight he said after a long while elisha did not arrest his playing of a mournful song oh lord have mercy on me they'll be here said elisha and as he spoke there was a knocking on the door elisha stopped playing john went to the door where two sisters stood sister mccandles and sister and sister price praise the lord son they said Praise the Lord, said John. They entered, head bowed, hands folded before them around their Bibles. They wore the black cloth coats that were all that they wore all week, and they had old felt hats on their heads. John felt a chill as he passed them, and he closed the door. Elisha stood up, and they cried again, praise the Lord. Then the two women knelt for a moment before their seats to pray. This was also a passionate ritual. Each entering saint, before he could take part in the service, must commune commune for a moment alone with the lord john watched the praying women alicia sat again at the table and picked up his mournful song the women rose sister price first and then sister mccandles and looked around the church as we the first asked sister price her voice was mild her skin was copper she was younger than sister mccandles by several years a single woman who had never seen as she testified or a single woman who had never as she testified known a man no, Sister Price smiled, Brother Alicia. Brother Johnny here was the first. Him and me cleaned up this evening. Brother Johnny is mighty faithful, said Sister McCandles. The Lord's going to work with him in a mighty way. You mark my words. There were times whenever, in fact, the Lord had shown his favor by working through her. When, when whatever Miss uh, Sister McCandles said sounded like a threat. Tonight she was still very much under the influence of the sermon she had preached the night before. She was an, an enormous woman, one of the biggest and blackest God had ever made. And he had blessed her with the mighty voice with which to sing and preach. And she was going out soon into the field. For many years the Lord had pressed Sister McCandles to get up as she said and move. But she had been of timid disposition and feared and feared to set herself above others not until he laid her low before this very altar had she dared to rise and preach the gospel but now she had buckled on her traveling shoes but now she had buckled on her traveling shoes she would cry aloud and spare not and lift up her voice like a trumpet in zion yes she, yes said mr price oh no yes said sister price with her gentle smile he says that he has okay he says that he that is faithful in the little things shall be made chief over many John smiled back at her, a smile that despite the shy gratitude it was meant to convey, did not escape being ironic or even malicious. But Sister Price did not see this, which deepened John's hidden scorn. Ain't but you two who clean the church, asked Sister McCandles with an unnerving smile. The smile of the prophet who sees the secrets hidden in the hearts of men. Lord, Sister McCandles. Lord, Sister McCandles. No, no. Lord, Sister McCandles. Um, Lord, Sister McCandless, said Alicia. Look like it ain't never but us two. Because she asked him, was only you two that cleaned before? Cleaned the church before service? Lord, Sister... And then uh, Alicia says this. Lord, Sister McCandless, said Alicia. Look like it ain't never but us two. I don't know what the other young folks do on Saturday nights, but they don't come nowhere near here. Neither did Alicia usually come anywhere near the church on Saturday evenings. But as a pastor's nephew, he was entitled to certain freedoms. In him, it was a virtue that he came at all. It sure is time we had a revival among our young folks, said Sister McCandles. They cooling off something terrible. The Lord ain't going to bless no church. What? Let his young peoples get so lax. No, sir, he said, because you ain't neither hot or cold. I'm going to spit on you out of my mouth. That's what the word. That's the word. And she looked around sternly and Sister Price nodded. And Brother Johnny here ain't even saved yet. Said Alicia, it looked like the saved young people would be ashamed to let him be more faithful in the house of God than they are. He said that the first shall be the last and the last shall be first, said Miss Sister Price which, with a triumphant smile. Indeed, he did, agreed Sister McCandles. This boy going to make it to the kingdom before any of them. You wait and see. Amen, said Brother Alicia, and he smiled at John. Is Father going to come and be with us tonight, asked Sister McCandles after a moment. Alicia frowned and thrust out his lower lip. 
I don't reckon so, sister, he said. I believe he's going to try to stay home tonight and preserve his strength for the morning service. The Lord's been speaking to him in the visions and dreams, and he got much he ain't got much sleep lately. Yes, said Mr. Sister McCandles. That sure was a praying man, I tell you. And in every it ain't every shepherd tarries before the Lord for his flock like Father James does. Indeed, that is the truth, says Sister Price with animation. The Lord sure don't bless us with the good shepherd. He mighty hard sometimes, says Sister McCandles, but the word is hard. The word of holiness ain't no joke. He done made me know that, said Brother Alicia with a smile. Sister McCandles stared at him, and she laughed. Lord, she cried, I bet you can say so, and I loved him for that, says Sister Price. It ain't every pastor going to set down his own nephew in front of the whole church, too, and Alicia hadn't committed no big fault. Ain't no such thing, says Sister McCandles, has a little fault or a big fault. Saying gets his foot in the door, he ain't going to rest till he's in the room. You was in the word or you ain't, and no halfway with God. Ain't no halfway with God. You reckon we ought to start, asked Sister Price doubtfully after a pause. Don't look to me like nobody else is coming. Now, don't you sit there, laughed Sister McCandles, and be of little faith like that. I just believe the Lord's going to give us a great service tonight. She turned to John. And your daddy coming out tonight? Yes, some John replied. He said he was coming. There, said Sister McCandles. And your mom, is she coming out too? I don't know, John. She she mighty tired. She ain't so tired she can't come out and pray a little while, she, said Sister McCandles. For a moment, John hated her, and he stared at her fat, black profile in anger. Sister Price said, but I declare it's a wonder how that woman works like she does and keeps those children looking so neat and clean and all and gets out to the house of God almost every night. Can't be nothing but the Lord that bears her up. I reckon we might have a little song, said Sister McCandles, just to warm things up. I sure hate to walk in a church where folks are just sitting and talking, looking like it takes all my spirit away. Amen, said Sister Price. Alicia began a song. This may be my last time. And they began to sing. This may be my last time I pray with you. This may be the, my last time. I don't know. As they sang, they clapped their hands, and John saw that Sister McCandles looked about her for a tambourine. He rose and mounted the pulpit steps and took from the small opening at the bottom of the pulpit three tambourines. He gave one to Sister McCandles and nodded and smiled, not breaking her, breaking her rhythm, and he put the rest on a chair near Sister Price. This may be the last time I sing with you. This may be the last time I sing with you. I don't know. He watched them singing with them because otherwise they would force him to sing and try not to hear the words that he, that he forced outward from his throat and he thought to clap his hands but he could not they remained tightly folded in his lap if he did not sing they would be upon him but his heart told him that he had no right to sing or to rejoice oh this may be my last time this may be my last time oh this may be my last time and he watched elisha who was a young man in the lord who was a priest after the order of melchizedek had been given power over death and hell the lord had lifted him up and turned him around and set his feet on the shining way what were the thoughts of elisha when night came and he was alone where no eye could see and no tongue bear witness save only the trumpet-like tongue of god where his thoughts his bed his body fell over his dreams this may be my last time i don't know Behind him, the door opened and the, the wintry air rushed in. He turned to see, entering the door, his father, his mother, and his aunt. It was only the presence of his aunt that shocked him, for she had never entered this church before. She seemed to have been summoned to witness a bloody act. It was in all her aspect, it was in all her aspect, quiet with the dreadful quietness as she moved down the aisle behind his mother and knelt for a moment beside his mother and father to pray. John knew that it was the hand of the Lord that had led her to this place, and his heart grew cold. The Lord was riding on the wind tonight. The Lord was riding on the wind tonight. What might that wind have spoken before the morning came? What might have that wind spoken? What might that wind have spoken before the morning came? Oh, uh, yeah, that's the end of uh, part part one. Part one, what was the name of part one? The next one is part two, the prayers of the saints. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on earth? Part two, the prayer of the saints. What was this part one? Part one. Did it start on page one? Part one was the seventh day. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth come and let him that is a thirst come and whoever will and whoever will let him take the water of life freely. I just want to see if it started on page one, this book. One, two. This book starts on page three. Three all the way to... Um, 65 so i read about 63 pages 62 pages not bad uh one hour and 38 minutes 
Hope you guys like that first uh, ch uh, part of this book. I believe I read this book before. It sounds very familiar. I'm glad I'm getting it on here, though. Peace, y'all. Later, when I get to my truck, I'll probably read a chapter of, um, of um, what is it, Dante's Inferno? I'll probably read. Peace, y'all.